The good old clap, take one. That's right. How many of you knew what you wanted to be when you were seven years old? I did. I wanted to be world champion. Hey, is there honesty involved in this podcast? Can we be honest? We can shut your fucking lips. And then I'll just say, put them up once. Let's go. He's like, you look too pretty on the wave. Get ugly. We can talk about DMT if you want. Let's talk to your boxing. All right, so we're here for our final episode of the Lineup Podcast for 2021. I'm here with my producing partner, Hendo Bayer. Hendo, thanks for joining us on the Lineup, as you do every week. Where are you today? Who are you with? Did you surf? What's going on? Pleasure, as always, Dave. The pleasure is mine. I'm uh, I'm in San Diego. Um, I'm actually in the North Park area, not very close to the beach, but I did keep my eyes on the pier at Scripps and actually looked really good today but it's raining cats and dogs out there uh crazy offshore winds look super fun but uh i'm not gonna hit it today i'm just kind of <laughs> enjoying this cold weather how about yourself yeah i know i i had a little surf yesterday before the weather came in it's really fun um but no nothing today um i'll let the uh the river mouth sort of clear out um for the next couple of weeks but it looks like we got some weather for a few weeks so i think we're going to be inside which is Maybe not the worst thing. So I'll catch up on all the stuff that I've been putting off for too long, Christmas mm-hmm. wrapping and all that good stuff. So, yeah. Well, we we are here at at the end of the road for 2021, and we got a ton of um, listener uh, questions that have come in for our, our mailbag segment. But as it is our our last podcast for the season, we thought it'd be uh, fitting to to do a little review on the lineup uh, podcast fantasy wrap where we had our own podcast fantasy league again this season we had a ton of people who played like over 3500 so thank you for everyone that got involved we did our best to talk about who was performing every week but hendo who who were the top performers in our in our podcast league uh in 2021 yeah so once again thank you all for joining and playing throughout the year um keeping your attention on every event was no easy task and once again if you're not a part of the league it's called the lineup podcast league check it out on worldsurfleague.com and when we look back at last year here are our top five hitters these are the people who hit it out of the park and somehow stayed consistent with such challenging events and unpredictability at number one or actually you know what should we start at number five we don't want to give away one let's go reverse order yeah for sure countdown Okay, number five, we have Deem, that's D-E-M-E. Number four, we got Nobre, congratulations. Number three, Satter Daves. I wonder if that was for you, Dave, I don't know. Uh, Number two is Arthur Sales, and winning the entire league with a total of 6,164.91 points was Diego Frate underscore Sanja underscore B-R. It's very specific, like getting down to the hundredth of a point in this game. It's it's much more technical than I would have given it credit for. So good job. Good job by you guys <laughs> doing the final CK. Yeah, and uh, congrats to Diego. I do think Ryan sent him a nice little care package when he won. Um, so you know what? There are some stakes next year. We're going to re-up and... Uh, Hey, maybe you'll get a little hydro flask. Maybe you'll get something more. Maybe a jersey from your favorite surfer. You never know. We will try to supply you with a little treat if you uh, if you win there. Yeah, I mean, as long as our legal team doesn't listen to this, we can promise whatever we want. It's fine. <laughs> right. yeah, exactly. We're all going to Surf Ranch. Ooh, this is good. Diego, yeah. hit us up. Well, Dave, how'd you do in the league? Because all those top five did pretty well. It was no easy task. How'd you do? I love playing. I've loved playing since back when um, Surfer Magazine, before it went the way of the Dodo or, or whatever the situation is now, um, had its game. I really like playing. It, it, it adds stakes for me in a, in, uh, at events that I'm already working on. So I, I like doing it. And I do my best to like separate church and state and not kind of just uh, uh, do my job professionally without uh, getting too emotional about who's doing well, who's not. I'm not in the competitors area and screwing fin- fins or anything like that. But <laughs> Um, no, I never do that well in fantasy, despite um, what I'd like to think is I've got some okay insights as to what people are feeling and how they're performing and stuff. But um, I just had to look it up. I, I finished 1,154th in our league of uh, 3,500 plus. So, you know, in the top 50 percentile, it's not too bad. Yeah. Uh, my worst event was Newcastle, which was CT2 this last season. I finished 1,923rd. 
And my best event was Mexico. I finished 456. So a lot of room for improvement. I'm looking forward to, to 2022. How about you, Hendo? How'd you do? Uh, in our league, I finished 13th, actually. So that was kind of surprising. Um, I actually ended up winning a few leagues. 13th? Yeah. Me, oh. Out of 3,500 people? <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty good, man. Thirteen. What just... you see? How do you pick your team? What's your secret? Is it like no emotion whatsoever? Or you're like, I, I look at the draw and I change them mid round one. Like, are you, are you? Do you have like a strategy, or you just go with your gut? So my strategy was to start a podcast about fantasy surf and try to get mm. tips from everyone. And to, you know what? To no avail for a long time. I actually wasn't doing very well. The only reason I think that I did good last year was that the rules had changed and it took some people some time to adapt to those new rules. So when we got to Pipe and Maui, the women and the men were combined for your overall score plus the power surfer. So I'm not sure a lot of people knew about that. And so I read the rules and that event I did really well. Then the finals came along and that's really where I took off. I felt like people treated the finals like it wasn't the finals, but when it mattered the most for fantasy, it was that day, and that's where I just skyrocketed after that event. Mm. All right. Well, you just gave away the the store there to everyone listening. Everyone next to you is going to be on that same program. Got to read the rule book. <laughs> Got to read the rule book. <laughs> Pays to do your diligence. All right. I'm into it. I like it. I like it. I like it. Well, again, thanks to everyone who played, and uh, yeah, we'll be we'll be pushing it even harder in 2022 with our new schedule, which I'm really excited about. So I can't wait. Yeah. And going into that, what uh, what would you say is the event you're most looking forward to before we get into the mailbag segment? We'll jump in there, but. Oh, geez. Um, I'm really, I, I, I'm just, I mean, not to, not to be short-sighted about what's just in front of my face, but like, I'm really excited to see what pipeline's like in that late January window, um, just from a condition standpoint. And um it's been in that December 8th through 20th window as long as I've been here, which is, you know, 16 years. And some years we've got great waves. Some years we, we don't have great waves. The sort of wisdom that I've gleaned from, from people who know better than I do on the North Shore is that, you know, that December window is still fairly early season. So it, it's hit and miss. And often, even when you're hitting on swell, there's still a lot of sand on the reef because you haven't had those big... Uh, west swells or northwest swells come in and, and punch the sand off of the reef. So it, it was a lot of backdoor and less pipeline, I think, over the course of those years. Um, more 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 backdoor than pipeline was scoring. And what I've heard in terms of late season is that it's it's just a different animal. And so I'm I'm really excited to see what uh you know CT number one, the the Billabong Pro pipeline uh delivers to the the world's best surfers at the end of January. I'm excited about that. And um yeah, and I'm also just excited. I'm excited about all the events, but for sure. But um, maybe Garagigon is a, is a close second to Pipe. Just um, that event was on tour before I started working here, and and I think you know Kelly Slater might be the only person on tour that's ever been there. So <laughs> let alone competed there. Mm. So I just think it's cool. I think it's cool introducing sort of change into the mix and and seeing how everyone responds. Yeah, I can't wait. For how about her. how about you? What what about you? What events are you looking forward to? Yeah, I gotta say, Gland too, fellow Goofy Footer, and uh, just. A lot of fond memories of middle school watching the Quicksilver G Land Pro. I think uh, Allison Chains was part of the soundtrack. I just remember Rob Machado being so good out there. And uh, I'm really looking forward to it. I think they surfed Money Trees and Speedies or a few of the waves, right? And did they do the skins that year? I can't remember if they did or not. But It's hard to remember. I, I, I mean, I've heard from a bunch of folks, you know, Ross Williams, Pat O'Connell, people that were on tour in those days. And they're like, it is an incredible. Like you will definitely score waves in that time of year with that moon and the tide, and it's just going to be awesome. So I, I I think it's going to be a really rad event. Awesome. Well, thanks for that, and thanks again to everyone playing. Um, make sure moving forward in regards to fantasy, you join our league. And Dave, we got a lot of mailbag questions, so we're just going to get straight into it. This bag is uh, it's like bigger than Santa's pouch, so it's weighing us down. But uh, let's start it off with at Joel Sinton. Which conversation on the lineup did you enjoy most? Mm, that's a, I, we get that one a lot. I feel like we get that one almost every week. So it's it's a hard one to uh, answer, um, and and even hard to remember. Like I think the last couple of years have been so blurry. I'm like, what? Who did we talk to? It was that last year. I don't remember. But there were so many good ones. You know, um, Randy Rarick, Eski Britton. 
Um, I, I think a lot of people and myself included really enjoyed the, the Nick Carroll and Jamie Brissett conversations. I thought those were great. Um, I love talking to Meg Bernardo who, who hired me, you know, 16 years ago and, and got to share, you know, what, what she's done for the sport over her many decades with the world's best surfers. And then, yeah, geez, like just getting to do some in person as well, whether it was Isabella Nichols or Brisa Hennessy, Chloe Handino, they're all really fun. I, I, I definitely think like even kind of the Brisa one from a few weeks ago, I'm like, oh, it's so different being actually in the room with somebody. So I think we're, we'll push for more of those in 2022 if we can if we can help it. But I can't I can't just pick one. They're all they're all really special in their own way. Yeah, that's tough. Well, you named a lot of good ones there. Uh, next question is from at wave underscore Wahinis. How hard has it been with the ever-changing restrictions and what positives have they led to? Mm. I'm, I'm guessing I'm guessing that means COVID. Um, geez, <laughs> it's like, I don't know. I don't know what plan ended up getting executed at the end of the day, but it wasn't A, B, C, or D probably. Like we just, we were developing plans and then contingency plans for those plans and contingency plans for those plans. And um, yeah, it was really hard. Um, you know, I think, I, I think surfing and the sport of surfing is sort of a microcosm of everyone trying to live their lives and, and get through the pandemic was a real challenge. And, you know, trying to run a global tour with an international field and, and countries having different protocols and, and, um, it, it was really tricky. And I think, you know, the entire WSL from top to bottom and, the leadership team and our regional managers and their regional teams and the events team did like amazing, amazing work, um, just to have a full tour and, um, positives that they led to. Um, geez, it's a good question. I, I, I think on a smaller level, I think just general preparedness, like even though we're really confident about the 22 calendar from top to bottom, like, again, we're, we're already pre-planning these contingencies just in case. Um, so we're not scrambling in the event that we need to. Um, but I think like the, the main positive is it just for our company really galvanized our identity in a lot of ways, which for me was the, the most important thing in the sense of you know, I think, I think we've done a lot of great things in surfing and we've done a lot of different things in surfing over the last few years, but at the center of it all, um, is, you know, we're here to crown world champions and we're here to steward the world's best surfing as best we can and provide a platform for that. And I think the challenge the last few years, the, the, the positive that, I, that I'd say led to for our company is just focusing the organization around that. And then all the businesses within the organization, rallying around that as like a center of gravity and i know we have a lot more work to do but i think that's been the, the biggest positive that the last two years have been for our, for the wsl yeah and i uh yeah i applaud the efforts of the whole team and just looking back at australia and chartering a jet and just events going here or there to different locations i mean the adaptability that it created within both the staff and the athletes and the patience that people showed uh, is is above and beyond. So um, props to everybody there. And it was a lot of fun to watch as a viewer and a few events to work at as well. Um, all right, well, moving on to at AlexHB27. What was the most exciting event for Dave besides the final, which was also epic? Well, yeah, I, I, that's a good question. Um, I was in Hawaii in December, um, but was in a contact tracing group. So I was actually locked in the house for 12 days. Um, did not get COVID, got tested multiple times every day, but um, you followed the protocols and then uh, left. So um, that was not exciting. And, and even if it was, it wouldn't have been for the right reasons. And then I was at Surf Ranch and then was at the finals. And, and I think just in totality, the finals, as, as Alex pointed out, were awesome. So I, I was most excited about that. But um, yeah, geez, it was it was just interesting seeing that four event Australian leg and seeing how people responded and reacted. And I've been to um, you know all those spots outside of Rottnest Island, and so Rottnest was really cool to see, and it was cool to talk to everybody on the ground while they were out there and and understand you know how the event was going and how the waves were, and it, it sounded really really cool. Um, I just, I, for whatever reason, I just really liked the action in Nairobi and I thought the waves kind of delivered, they're clean and pumping and I thought the surfing was awesome and I like those events and I, I appreciate that not every event needs to be that, but like 
you know, high quality beach break like Narrabeen, um, high frequency of waves and just a lot of action, you know, and, and I, I love going to remote venues and like reef breaks and reef passes and big waves and all that stuff. Um, but you don't, sometimes you get those heats where it's like you just, the surfer just needs the two waves or they can only get the two waves and that's how they get through. But I, as a viewer, um, because I was watching it at home, like I, I just like watching a lot of action. And I thought Narrabeen in particular was just really good for that. And, and the surfing was amazing. Yeah. And we saw some incredible airs from there. Um, Gabe's full rotation. Was that Newcastle or Narrabeen? That front side? Uh, the the big, the big full rotation was Newcastle. Okay. I think on the final day. Um, Carissa's was at Newcastle as well. Okay. I think Narrabeen, we had like Connor did really well. Right. Um, there was that, that, what people think was controversial, but the sort of the non-completion about Italo's era, right. which I don't, I don't think that's controversial, but I appreciate that people like the drama. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, you know, Gabriel just sort of ascending, you know, I, I thought it was just cool. Like, and, and is like, again, a goofy footer. I like laughs. I, I like kind of wedgy, you know, high frequency waves where you can get a bunch of waves. <laughs> like it just seems super fun. Um, yeah. I, I enjoyed it. I thought Narrabeen was cool. Yeah, and I love some of the episodes we did around that Oz leg with Laura Enever and Duma and uh, Connor and Jack Robbo, a few other people. Those episodes were great. If you haven't heard them, go check them out. And speaking of Aussies, we got a question from a friend of the pod, at Masciano. When will WSL increase the amount of women on tour? Mm -hmm. Yep friend of the pod, um, Marciano hitting us with the hard questions. I, I feel like we answer this question every year, maybe like a few times a year. Cause it's, it's certainly a point of interest in a sport that's, that's driven first the parody conversation then the equality conversation in a really positive direction. When it comes to, um, championship tour fields, I know that, you know, Jesse Miley Dyer and the tours and competition office in concert, you know, with myself and the rest of the leadership team, this is a conversation we have quite often and really kind of where the answer is right now is it's based off of global talent pools you know and i don't think this is quite accurate in terms of 2021 but a few years ago the uh, sema study had the the gender dynamic just in terms of global surfing populace at at nine to one nine men for every um one woman that, that was in the water and if you think of that in sort of broad development pools through which you can matriculate world-class talent, um, we just kind of don't have a big enough pool at the moment to match the men's side or a small enough pool on the men's side to match the women's side, right? And so you already have sort of a nine to one global population that again, might've adjusted in the last couple of years, but it's still probably, there's probably still quite a gap there. And then you kind of say, okay, well, out of that, there's a fraction of them that are QS surfers. And out of them, there's a fraction of them that are Challenger Series surfers. And then out of them, there's a fraction of them that are CT surfers. Um, so working with the Tours and Competition Office, at the end of the day, the championship tour is about having the very best surfers on tour. And the current thinking is that if you shrank the men's field down to match the women's field, you would be missing out on some world-class talent in, in, in that sort of, um, the surfers that, that, that you remove from the tour at the same time, if you increased the women's field to match the men's, you would maybe be diluting that high concentration of talent on the tour right now. So in 2022, we're starting with 36 man fields on the men's side and 18 women fields on the women's side. That's getting curbed down to 24 men and 12 women. Um, so the fields are being reduced by a third after the mid-year cut and then five and five for the WSL finals. So mm. um, I don't know of any immediate plans to change that, but I do know that there's a deliberate effort to grow that pool from the ground up, whether that's working with amateur organizations or the pro junior series, the qualifying series, the challenger series, and creating a bigger opportunity for more women to participate at those entry levels. So you end up having a bigger pool to draw elite championship tour talent from. So who knows, in a couple of years, those numbers may balance out so that there's an equal number of men and women on tour. But right now, because of the discrepancy and a largely like a, a legacy-based discrepancy in terms of how many men have served versus how many women have served, even sort of recreationally, um, the numbers are where they're at. Right, well, we do see a new crop and uh, I am forever impressed by this new rookie class coming. Uh, so let's 
do hope that those numbers increase on the women's side and uh, we have a level playing field there. And I'm just looking forward to the action coming up next year. Speaking of men and women, uh, we have another question from at Malini underscore MS. How is the decision to run men's or women's heats made? Yeah, that's a good question. And it's it's changed over the years. When I first started, um, the decision on what to run and when to run it was made um, with three people. It was the event organizer, who at the time when I started was often a representative from one of the brands. So, you know, someone from Rip Curl or Quicksilver or Billabong or whoever was running the event would have a say. Um, the surfer's representative who would come in and have a say. And then the head judge uh, that the ASP employed would have a say. And so it was a majority vote on who ran and when and what time. Um, after the acquisition, that that conversation became sort of the sole um, decision of the commissioner's office. So for a period of time, it was at Kieran Perot's discretion or one of his sort of um, staff members, you know, Renato Hickel or Jesse Miley Dyer. Now Jesse Miley Dyer is the head of tours and competition. It is her decision on, on who runs and when. Um, and they are, are really open about it. You know, they'll be talking to both the surfers reps and just the surfers in general to get a sense of how they're feeling, if they want to run, when they want to run, who wants to run. Um, as well as um, local experts. Um, so everywhere we go, we work to engage with those communities to understand tides and winds and swell directions and sand and what to expect and how much we can run and who should go out, et cetera, et cetera. And it, it, it is always a process. Occasionally, there'll be overlap where you know, the, the, the men really want to run and the women really want to run. And there's a decision that gets made that's for the betterment of everybody where we say, look, we're going to run you guys now. We're going to run you girls later or vice versa. Um, but yeah, at the end of the day, the decision gets made uh, by the tours and competition representative who is on site. Yeah, that's good to know. I feel like a lot of people don't really know those decisions and or know about the surfers reps. Are you at liberty to say who the surfers reps are next year moving forward? Or? Uh, I don't know if I'm at liberty to say or not. Okay. I also don't know if I got the right answer. I think I yeah. know who they are, but um yeah, I I, uh, I don't think it's a huge secret, um, but I I wouldn't say in case I get in trouble. Yeah, I just I think the general <laughs> public would love to know that um, you know, the surfers do have a say in it. Obviously, when the waves are pumping or not, and that it's not just WSL. So it's it's equally balanced there. And I think that um, that's a really great question, and you nailed it there. It's a it's a good one. I will tell a little story just for everyone's benefit, and I I think I can name names, but um. Years and years ago at the Rip Curl Search event in uh, Chile, in Arica, um, which was this really nasty barreling slab on like a <laughs> like an urchin encrusted rock shelf um, that was way out on this man-made peninsula. It's just a wild place. Um, and we went there for the search event. And this must have been 2007 um, because in 2008 we were in Bali and they used to go cold water, warm water. So my my guess is it was Arica was 2007. And at the time, um, Neil Ridgeway at Rip Curl was the event representative who, who's still there and he's done amazing stuff with, mm -hmm. with that brand and, and continues to, but he was there as the event representative and Perry Hatchett was the, the ASP head judge and he was the head judge for a number of years. And the surfer representative was uh, an Australian named Phil McDonald, big power surfer, like yeah, an amazing surfer. And, Every day we would walk out from the hotel. It was probably like a, a half mile. You'd walk from the hotel and a quarter mile up this sort of um, peninsula that was man-made. And you'd look at these waves and they're just huge barrels, but they're a little bit all over the place. And kind of there was no way to get like in without just basically like bouncing off the rocks. Um, it was huge. You know, it was, it was, I don't know what you call it, like eight, 10 foot Hawaiian, like really, really big waves. And we're there with all the surfers and no one was surfing. I, and I remember the people who were surfing and it was um, Chilean Ramon Navarro, who was mm -hmm. incredible and mm -hmm. fearless. It was Australian Josh Kerr. It was American Chris Ward. And it was Australian Luke Munro, which mm -hmm. is a weird assemblage of surfers to like go out there and get barreled every morning, considering like the top 45 that were around at the time. But they're the only ones surfing. And I remember sitting in the little uh, event organizers room, which is where I would post up and listening to the conversation every day. And Neil would come in and say, oh my God, it's pumping. Like we have to go today. Like it's beyond now. And, and Phil would come in 
and say, no way, it's too dangerous. It's too big. It's, it's, it's this wave's nuts. Like we have to wait for it to get, to get safer. And Perry Hatchett would side with Phil and say, yep, the surfers don't think it's safe. We're not going to go today. So we have to write like a press release where we didn't say it was too big, but it was kind of like, ah, oh, it's uncontestable or some bullshit word that we'd use. And this went on like five days, Groundhog Day, same thing. We turn up, waves are pumping. Neil would say, we got to go. Phil would say, no, it's too dangerous. And Perry would go, all right, it's too dangerous. We're not going to go. Day six, same thing happens. It's probably bigger actually than it was. <laughs> and the little pageant plays out again. Neil says, it's pumping. What are you doing? You're the world's best surfers. You got to get out there and go get barreled. And we have to run this event. And Phil was like, I'm sorry, it's just too dangerous. Like, we don't want to run. And then Perry finally looks at both of them and goes, it's not getting any smaller. Like, we have to run. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that yeah. was kind of the way that we ran that event. Not really. um, and it was very memorable. Andy Irons ended up winning. And uh, But yeah, it was. that's how it used to run. And now um, it's it's uh, probably a more civil version of that with uh, the Tourism Competition Office making the decision. Yeah, I got to go back and watch the vault on that. I would love to check that event out. It sounds... Like some gnarly slabs. Speaking of events, we got a question here from at Captain underscore Robbie underscore C. What would your complete customized dream tour locations and order be? <laughs> oh, thanks, Captain Robbie C. Um, geez, that's a good question. I I don't. I mean, I could spend a lot of time like thinking about it and writing it down, but not to sound like too much of a homer, but it wouldn't really be too different to what we have, honestly, in 2022. Like starting the season in a prime window for pipe, going to Sunset Beach, which is a whole different animal, going to Super Tubos and Paniche in, in prime winter window, with lots of swell and 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 predominantly offshore winds. You know, Bells Beach and Margaret River are awesome. Um, G land's awesome. Like it, it all to me makes a ton of sense in terms of like, and I guess in a tiny, tiny way, I, I had a role in customizing the dream tour. So it's like, I should be okay with it. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I, I think the tour looks really, really good for 2022. I, I think, um, not so much a critique, but a, a request that I I've heard and I agree with is, is more high performance left-handers and and we'll see how GLAN stacks up obviously as a high performance left-hander but you know um I, I do think that's something that we could add um or or look to add whether that's uh you know macaronis in Indonesia or going back to Fiji and it, it I I think that that's something that would round out the tour that we currently have potentially adding another wave system back on tour but if the idea of the tour is to have all these different types of waves, lefts, rights, beach breaks, reef breaks, point breaks, um, high performance waves, like really scary sort of critical commitment waves. Like there's a really good mix on the schedule for 2022. And, and there should be, because at the end of the day, we're here sifting through the world's best surfers to see who is the actual best in this variety of conditions. So I'm I'm pretty good with the order. But again, it, it, I think it's because I was just part of that process too. So I... I I at least have a tiny sort of pinky fingerprint on it um, that I should I should back myself on. Right. What about well, you? What about you, Hendo? Who, what's missing? Where should we be going? Well, I was gonna ask you just in case he was wondering what your personal dream tour would be if you could choose one personal wave where you wanted to surf. I was wondering if, oh. if he was thinking that or if they were thinking that, uh, Captain Robbie. That's a good question. Um, certainly not a CT tour. <laughs> like I would. <laughs> As much as I probably would have said when I was like 18 to 25, like, yeah, about that tour. But like now, yeah, no way. I, I, I'm much more sober about my own abilities. Um, I mean, I can stick with macaronis. I, I had had the fortune of going there a long, long time ago. And mm -hmm. um, that's an amazing wave. I, I wish I was a better surfer. I it's funny, like I'm older now, but I'm a much better surfer than I was when I was sort of in a more physical prime, I guess. I feel all right physically now. But like, it's one of those things where I'm like, you end up surfing like a tiny beach break by your house and you know, it's cold and dumpy and you're like, Oh man, like I did okay out there, but like, man, I, I, I really wish I was a, the surfer I am now at macaroni's back when I was there kind of thing. Cause I just would feel like I would learn so much more in those couple of days surfing there with what I know now. Um, and then, yeah, my other favorite wave on the planet is uh Duramba. 
which I think is uh, wildly mm. underrated. <laughs> so fun. Such a good way. What about what about you, Hendo? What would you what would be a couple of spots that would be on your customized personal dream tour? Well, I would say if it was for the CT athletes, um, I would love to see something in the Caribbean. Uh, I'm not going to get too specific with names, but somewhere around the Caribbean side of Panama, I've been there and there are some fantastic waves that are both high performance and crazy slabbing barrels. So um, I think that would offer a lot of variety. And then I love watching Fiji. I mean, Tavarua restaurants, when it's doing its thing, it is just jaw dropping and... Um, yeah, from a selfish standpoint, working in Tavrua has been a dream a few times. I've been lucky to go, and uh, I think about it a lot. But if it was a personal tour for me, it would probably be all lefts, like Ulu's or even the beach break at Chonggu. I mean, a few years ago, I flew all the way out to Bali and just surfed the beach break the whole time. And people were like, why'd you go out there and do that? I'm like, because I love beach breaks. I don't know. So <laughs> that would be my dreams there. Got to love like the it. beach breaks. Yeah. Um, all right, we got another question from at Riss Rem 33 Will there ever be another CT event on the East Coast of the USA? Mm, that's a good question. Um, I guess the last one was the Quicksilver Pro New York in 2011. The East Coast is, is tricky in terms of being confident that the waves are going to be there because the East coast has world-class waves, but predicting their windows and, and guaranteeing that even if it's not world-class that it would be contestable can be challenging. Um, and even when there are waves, there's, there's often weather associated with them. And, and, you know, the story behind the Quicksilver Pro in 2011, um, I remember being in Tahiti on the finals day. Um, and it was, uh, I think Ace Bucken beat Kelly Slater in the final. Um, I think that's the year it was. I, I, I might be getting that mixed up, but I remember Kelly. If if it wasn't 2011, uh, Ace did beat him in the final, and and Kelly was really frustrated. And I remember he was like taking off at like really extreme parts of the reef up Chopu, and um, like pinning himself to the bottom and on mm -hmm. the reef. And he was he was pretty banged up after that. But during the final, I remember I got a call from our CEO uh, Brody Carr at the time, who told me, "Hey, you need to start prepping." Um, a cancellation release for the Quicksilver Pro New York. It was a force majeure, you know, a hurricane's come through and, and blasted the site and um, it's going to be off. And I'm like, oh, wow, it's a big deal. And so everyone was meant to travel from Tahiti to New York, basically the surfers and the staff and everybody. So not only were we wrapping the Tahiti event, but everyone was starting to kind of make adjustments. And and I remember Renato Hickel, um, who's still with us on, on tour, but he was the tour manager at the time getting ready to send like an official note out to the surfers saying the events canceled because of a force majeure. Um, so, you know, make adjustments as needed. And as we're finishing the event and after I'd gotten off the phone, our CEO called me back and he's like, hold on the, it's not canceled now. I'm like, well, hold on. Like you guys just officially canceled it. All these things are in motion, but you know, the, the elements of the Quicksilver group were on their way out there to convince the, you know, the city that we should still run it. And it was a smaller event that they, than they'd initially intended, but, um, they focused just on the surfing and, and the waves ended up pumping and it was a really memorable event, or at least pumping in the later rounds In the earlier rounds. It, it was kind of hard, hard going. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, again, it, it's like the, the East coast has amazing waves. I think it's just a hard one for, for the CT to be able to rely on those amazing waves turning up, but never say never. I, I think that, um, the way that the schedule is mapped out now, it, it's pretty set and stable for a few years, but there's always an opportunity, um, to head out there if, if it makes sense. Yeah. Well, don't give up risk Rem, Cause, uh, yeah, that event was awesome. That New York event and everyone I talked to who worked it had a great time as well. Enjoying that fine city of New York. It's an <laughs> awesome city. Love it. Um, all right. We got another question from at E E Owens getting second in the men's. Does that make Felipe Toledo number two? The website makes me wonder. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a fair thing to wonder. Um, absolutely. The, the final standings at the Rip Curl WSL finals set the top five surfers seeding going into 2022. So Felipe Toledo will enter 2022 as the number two surfer in the world because he finished runner up to uh, now reigning three-time world champion Gabriel Medina at the Rip Curl WSL finals. Crazy. Um, all right. Another question from at the Jones aesthetic. 
Was it weird having the finals be an event not everyone was at? Hmm. I'm I'm guessing they mean not having the entire CT field at mm. the finals, um, which is an interesting question. Um, I mean, lower trestles, I think, had you know was at capacity in terms of people on on the on the beach and on the cobblestones there, so it certainly didn't feel empty. Um, I think there are some elements around COVID restrictions as well, where even if we could have had the entire tour there, we wouldn't have been able to have them, um, because of COVID restrictions and the athlete areas are smaller and more contained than they would have been otherwise. But, you know, I, I didn't feel like it was weird. I think that whether it's the final day of a CT event or, or even in the past when the world title has been happening at, at whatever event, you, I don't ever remembering having everybody there on the beach on that day, um, just because people are on their own programs and they end up leaving if they get knocked out or end up doing other things. And, you know, sometimes they get really emotional if they were in the running for an event win or for a world title win and, and it didn't work out their way. They don't really want to be around, um, mm -hmm. and see someone else win. And it goes the other way. There's other people who just absolutely want to be there and support, you know, either their compatriots or their team writers or whatever it is. And so it's a cool vibe, but yeah, I, I didn't feel like it was weird, um, at the rip curl WSL finals this year. And, and I think every surfer had their own kind of support group and, and, and whether they were in the sort of the official structure areas or just on the beach, it was, it was at capacity for sure. So, yeah. And I think a lot of the trestles locals would argue there was quite a few rippers in the water during the event. So, um, plenty of good free surfs going down hmm. but uh yeah at we got another question at liam manderville says lots of questions regarding the change to qualification reaction with ct cs surfers etc so i guess how's the overall reaction been with um the qualification change oh everyone loves it <laughs> um i say i i i mean i i say that joking but not really. I mean, I'm sure there's people that aren't a hundred percent enthusiastic about it. And at the end of the day, not everyone likes change all the time, but the surfers that I've talked to about it are, are really positive about the new three tier system, especially, you know, I mean, I'm talking to Brisa about it not too long ago and, and she talked to a lot of surfers when I was in Hawaii about it. And they're all pretty thrilled about being in that middle level on the challenger series and having sort of more premium wave venues and having sort of a consistent class of competitors to compete against, as opposed to, um, things that are a little less static on the qualifying series where there's multiple tiers and there's different waves and there's different people. And there's, it's, it, it just felt like a better system in their opinion. And, and this is them telling me this to develop surfers that were going to succeed on the championship tour. You know, it's just a better kind of matriculation system going from a regional qualifying series to this global challenger series that has sort of its own class of, of surfers um, competing in these premium wave venues and then qualifying for the championship tour. So I, I think it's really positive. I think it's hard to say. I think it's hard to say kind of um, if we know it's going to work in totality because we were almost at half flight this year because of COVID. But next year, I think the strengths that I saw personally this year from a design standpoint are going to work even better next year. And some of the the tricky parts that were maybe things that were, were trickier for us to navigate aren't going to be as big of an issue when we have sort of a full flight of events in 2022. Yeah, certainly makes it easier for me to explain professional surfing to those who are uninitiated I had a conversation with my Uber driver the other day he goes, Oh, like I didn't even realize that there was like a minor and major league. And it makes a lot more sense with that three tier when I was explaining it to him. So, uh, yeah, I think moving forward organization is key. Next question from at Silani, how y'all feel about the amount of rookies on tour? Do you think they're going to shake things up? Hmm. Yeah, I think I think we talked about this in last week's episode on the break room, but I, I don't know this for a fact, but it it feels like this is the biggest rookie class we've had in a number of years. In, in the sense that a lot of times we'd have sort of double qualifiers or qualifiers that had been on tour before. I mean, of course, we have a few this year too, but you know, on the women's side, in terms of true rookies, there's Gabriella Bryan, there's 
Betty Lucicura Johnson, Caitlin Simmers, India Robinson, Luana Silva. And on the men's side, you have Liam O'Brien and Jake lobster. Marshall and they have the lobster. <laughs> I love it. And Callum Robson, Samuel Pupo, you know, Ima Kalani Duvall, Luca Messinas, Xiao Xianca, Jackson Baker, Carlos Munoz. Y you have so many new people coming on tour. And um, you know, one of the things I, th I think I said this on last week's podcast, I can't remember, but you know, people were kind of like, well, there's not a, a Jordy Smith or a, a Gabriel Medina or, um, you know, Julian Wilson or, um, uh, Caroline Marks or, or sort of this like rookie qualifier that had been in the limelight for a long time that we, we are already putting kind of world title airs upon, um, and expect big things from. However, it my, my counter is also that in those situations, A, that rarely works, if ever. Um, and B, when it, that happens, it's like you get one or two of those surfers that come with a lot of hype and the rest of them are often kind of cannon fodder compared to both classes this year, which feel like they're going to be a little bit more under the radar just because of all the high profile talent that's focused on the championship tour. And I think because they're a little bit more under the radar, they have a better potential to perform and do some damage and make some inroads into those CT rankings, um, into the teens, into the under the, you know, 22 on the men's side and 10 on the women's side cut line. But it's going to be a challenge, right? Because you've got five hardcore events that they have to not only survive in, but thrive through in terms of pipeline, Sunset Beach, Super Tubas, Bells Beach, and Margaret River. Um, just to survive the mid-year cut. So it'll be interesting to see who does and who doesn't. But um, yeah, I, I, I think some of them are going to surprise people. That, that, that's my read on it. What about you, Hendo? Yeah, I think, I mean, looking back at last year, um, someone who kind of came under the radar was Morgan Sibilic. And did he shake things up? Absolutely. Making it to the top five in the finals. Um, he came out with postcards from Morgs prior to that, which was a great film, and I love that. But I didn't really know a lot about the guy going into it, and I learned so much about his competitive savviness and his backhand, which was so dynamic that um, I think there's a lot of opportunity for people coming in like that under the radar to just wow people. So this new class of rookies on both sides, there is so much potential there that um, I think people are just going to be amazed by a lot of the people coming up. Hmm. Let's see here. We got another question from a longtime listener and asker at Noah Purington. Thank you for your support. Um, they write best slash worst person to interview. <laughs> <laughs> so names and names. Um, I don't have a worst. Like I, I think if any of them have been suboptimal to use a, a phrase I enjoy, it's been on my side, you know, in the sense of like, I, you know, went in too rigid in terms of an outline or wanting to get something out of it and it didn't really go that direction or there were distractions happening. I think on both sides of the interview, like distractions can happen, especially when you're doing it over like, you know, the computer, right? Like there's internet issues or like things are happening as opposed to in the room. And um, yeah, I don't, I don't feel like there's been anyone in particular that's been a bad interview um, at all. And, and again, I, I, I don't really, they often kind of come off like this and I don't really mind the question, but like, I think the best episodes we do are less interviewee and more conversations. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I think, I think that's sort of, you get more out of probably me. Um, and certainly I get more out of the other person when it is like on more equitable, like, oh, they're asking me questions. I'm able to talk, but that sort of unlocks a question I had for them, you know, and we go back and have it, you go down some rabbit holes that, that end up being really, really interesting. And I think those are the, the best ones. Yeah. And personally, I think that's what makes this podcast so well-rounded is that, you know, you'll have some interviews that are conversations that are surface level surfing. There are some that are a little deeper where you get into being on tour or the psychology of sponsorships, et cetera. And, um, there's something for everyone here. So, uh, Dave, love, love what you've done with the place. Keep doing what you're doing. More stuff <laughs> coming for sure. So, Appreciate uh, it. we got another question from, uh, at O alley four seven. They ask five new talented women on the tour. Who do you think will do the most damage on the CT? Hmm. 
<laughs> That's one. This one's hard to dodge. Is, um, there, I need to name a name here. I mean, interestingly enough, like three out of those five rookies are are, are young Hawaiian women. Um, so they're doing something right over there. I I mean, geez, we talked about this on the last podcast, so I have a little bit of air cover. I mean, I think that Gabriella Bryan is is really impressive in terms of power package. Like, I, I think they all are. Um, I think Gabriella could really do some damage on the CT. It's just going to be interesting to see, again, going back to the schedule, like we could be at like really serious conditions at pipeline and then really kind of in that football field sized, like takeoff zone lineup of Sunset Beach. And then in like really kind of proper heavy super tubos. So like you might not see traditionally like, high performance maneuver based surfing until you get to bell's beach and even then um there might be it might be huge you know so it might be back to kind of bigger power surfing so i i think gabriella for sure but yeah i mean they've all got like major major talent and and they all seem more or less fearless so i i think all five of the the rookies on the women's side are going to be something to contend with and i mean geez like Betty Lou's performance in Haleiwa was just really, really impressive. And and also, I think out of the five, I mean, I, I know Caitlin Simmers has been spending a lot of time over there. I'd, I'd imagine India Robinson's going to as well. But it's a huge advantage being able to have the first two championship tour events at home in Hawaii. And and they're more or less probably going to be staying there and, and training for pipe and training for Sunset Beach and getting really comfortable Whereas the rest of the tour is home for the holidays and probably not heading over to Hawaii until, you know, early to mid January. Yeah, that's certainly an advantage. And uh, yeah, as we heard in the last episode, I got to say, it's hard to choose here, but definitely rooting for Betty Lou. And I'm excited. Have you surfed Sunset much? You've been out there? I mean, yes, although with the proviso that like I'm a civilian, so it's not you know, when I, I'm not, in, not equating like what I've done out there to what anyone at any level of competitive surfing's done. But for sure, for a number of years, when we'd go over for multiple weeks during the Triple Crown, we were fortunate enough to stay in houses, you know, in the Sunset Beach backyards community. And um, yeah, it's, it's just another one of those spots that to me um, reinforced the idea that I actually got much better out there the the older I got because I spent more time out there, you know, mm-hmm. and it was less about, oh, I'm in like peak physical condition for my age, which let's face it, I never was. But it was less about being like young and hungry and amped and more about just understanding like the wave uh, and, and where it broke and what to do and which ones to go on, where to position yourself and what your lineup markers were. And it was just, and that to me is sort of just, illustrative of surfing in general like you can like just at the end of the day just understanding how the water moves and how waves move i've i've discovered does so much more for my surfing than trying to force something um just because i want to do it on a wave that maybe wouldn't allow anybody to do it but Mm. again all of that with the the bucket disclaimer of again civilian based (laughs) surfing answer um but you know going back to the 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 point that that i think we made earlier with the randy rarick uh, podcast that happened early early in 2020 and people should go listen to um he he um his identity as a surfer and and certainly a chunk of his career is revolved around sunset beach he lives there and he surfs it every swell and and he is incredible out there and um he was really really amped about the championship tour event at sunset beach because it is such a different wave and it does test surfers in a different way and and um even throughout the course of that conversation um he had me convinced i'm like this you know this makes a ton of sense that this should be on tour um and and i'm excited to see it happen here in in just a few weeks now because (laughs) tour is starting pretty quickly yeah, same. I was going to say the same. My experience out there is completely civilian and minimal. I'd say I've only been out like once or twice, and that was maybe at Sunset Point or Mothers, and I've surfed at like knee high. And even then, these sets would just bend and come out of nowhere, and I was way too deep, and I would just get clobbered, and it scared the living crap out of me. So I am beyond thrilled to watch CT surfers compete out there. It's been a long time coming, and uh, I think it'll make for a good event, so... That should be exciting. Uh, we got another question here from at Jody Bars. Would love to hear your thoughts about the Dream Tour. 
my thoughts about the dream tour. Um, well, um, I mean, the, the idea of the dream tour is probably what hooked me into the ASP as a fan when I was, you know, a kid, uh, and just, I, I've told this story before, but when I started the president at the ASP was 1978 world champion, Wayne rabbit Bartholomew. And, and he was president at the ASP for uh, 10 years. And I think I hit him, you know, sort of towards the end, he was president for a few years after I started, um, and he was one of the principal architects of the Dream Tour. And if you you look back at the schedules in sort of the 70s and 80s and, and even early 90s, the, the tour was sort of, you know, dozens, if not, you know, more events just all over the world, wherever they can get an event, because it was a sport in its infancy. And that kind of created these two parallel realities of, okay, these events are happening in sort of city-based beach breaks often, um, to draw a lot of crowds to the beach so they could, you know, sell merchandise or, or whatever it was, um, and see the world's best surfing live, even though the conditions didn't quite suit was one reality. And, and the other reality that was happening is that professional surfers, whether they were succeeding on tour or not, at the end of the day, they're just surfers and they, they wanted to get good waves. So they were out getting good waves, like either in between events and occasionally during events, but, um, you know, just traveling and, and, and rabbit and, and a few others saw the opportunity to say that, look, like the best version of competitive surfing is to take the best surfers you can find and put them in the best waves you can find. And that's a formula to see some cool shit. And, and it's not that much more complicated than that. And so in sort of the early to mid nineties, that's what it, that's what happened. You know, you had companies that backed that vision and started investing in places like Garagagon and, and Jeffrey's Bay and, um, Fiji and, and, and Tahiti and, and waves that were very remote, but were producing, you know, live competition in, in these, um, amazing scenarios and creating kind of the conditions for something really special to happen. And, um, when I started, you know, he, he broke that down for me almost, you know, I probably said it a thousand times. So it, it just kind of how I just said it, but, um, and it made all the sense in the world to me and it still does. I think, I think one thing that he did add to me though, that I, I think it's lost a lot of the time is that his philosophy on the dream tour was always an 80, 20 philosophy, which was, you know, 80% of the CT locations should be in the very best waves we can find at the very best times of the year. The other 20% should be, you know, really audience driving venues, whether it's sort of Huntington Beach or, or Rio de Janeiro or, you know, New York City or, or San Francisco or whatever it is. So, you know, we can engage with, you know, mass audiences um, live and they can see the world's best surfing live so that they can follow them when we go remote to, you know, far flung parts of the, the world. Um, so I always felt like that was a good way to look at it, you know, where it's like, oh, not, not every stop should be in Indonesia, despite what my inner self would like to see, you know, like, it's a really good thing to have not only a variety of ways, but to have, you know, locations on tour that drive different interests and where people can kind of see the world's best surfing live. I think that's really, really important. And, um, I think amazingly, despite, radical economic fluctuations globally over the course of the last 15 years. I think where we're at in 2022 is a, a CT schedule that really honors the, the ideals of the dream tour. Like we're going to these incredible waves because we're going back to what bugs wanted. He's just, and what I think a lot of us want is surfers, which it's like, this isn't complicated. Like get the best surfers you can find, put them in the best waves you can find, and you're going to see some cool shit. And we do time and time again. So, um, those are my thoughts on the dream tour. Awesome. Well, I got nothing to add there. You, you nailed it. Uh, so thanks for that question. Uh, we got a couple more. We got one here from at Dawson dot dr one skill. Do you see the finals format from now on? Will the CT ever go back to ending at pipeline? Oh, those are good questions. Um, for sure. I think, I think we fully believe in the, WSL finals format, um, and our partner with Rip Curl, Rip Curl WSL finals. Um, and we're really, really psyched with, with how it went at lower trestles this year. Um, 
it performed really, really well um, in terms of audience. And um, it's the biggest day for us in, in surfing history in terms of audience. And I think going back to what we've talked about on this podcast a lot and even sort of this episode of the idea is to create conditions to see something really special. And, and I think the finals format and getting those final WSL final five men and women to that venue every year and putting them in that format, you're seeing some of the best surfing you're ever going to see in the live arena with all the stakes on the line. So I think that's really, really special. And as far as it going back to ending at pipeline, certainly not in the near term, you know, I think the redesign of the tour is the CT is now running from January through August with the Rip Curl WSL finals happening in September. September is not a month where, where pipelines at its best. So won't be going back to ending at pipeline, but I also think that's pretty special because if it's not going to end at pipeline, it seems fitting that the world's best surfers and the championship tour would start at pipeline, you know, in Hawaii, um, the birthplace of surfing. And I think there's just a lot of special things that can go on there. And again, I'm, I'm really excited to see what pipeline delivers in this new window of time when, um, historically there's been great waves, um, on offer there. So yeah, that's, those are my answers for that question. Awesome. Well, any uh, spoiler updates on the finals for 2022 yet, or do we still got to hold on to our hats? <laughs> hold on to your hats. Okay. To be announced soon, someday. Um, yeah. All right. Be be before September, I'm pretty sure. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Next question from at Bacon on Tour. Gotta love it. Uh, <laughs> what I is love the Bacon? Yeah. Awesome name. What is the WSL doing to help pro surfers that retire from the WSL mental mm. care, et cetera? Yeah, it's a good question. I think it's actually been a, a big topic of conversation across, um, a lot of sports. Um, so for those who don't know, there's a, a surfers union, um, the world pro surfers, the WPS that we've been working with, um, for years and years and years. And, after the ASP was acquired at the end of 2012, one of the things that, that came out of that acquisition was a pension fund for, for the surfers union and for surfers that retired. And um, they have like their whole organization that's separate and professional and ran by a gentleman named Christian Becerra. Um, and they, they decide what to do with those funds and, and they allocate those as needed to, to surfers that need them. But I do think that there's a lot to do within the surfing sport, not just from the WSL, but from the industry and communities as well. Um, just to make sure that, that the surfers who are dedicating their lives to pursuing the world title and pursuing a career in, in professional surfing are, are given all the advantages possible, whether it's education or job training or investment advice, or as, as I think was, was highlighted mental care as well, which, um, you know, we do provide, um, on tour from the WSL's perspective as well. So I think there's a lot of things just in terms of duty of care and, and taking care of athletes that we are doing that, that is much, much more than we were doing when I started, um, which is great to see, but I, I think there's a lot just to make sure that everyone's feeling safe and secure, um, during their career and after their career, which is a hard thing, right? Because, you know, surfing is, um, kind of operates on the fringes of society in a lot of ways. And, and so does the industry and so does the media and so does the sport in some ways. And so, um, yeah, I, I think it, I say that because I think it's in, almost especially important that we take care of people, um, in that respect. Mm -hmm. For sure. Well, thanks for that question. We've got two more. So uh, here we go. Second to last from at Nor Bell R. Dave, is there any surf spot in your bucket list you are still missing? <laughs> I'm, I'm sure there are hundreds. Um, I, I've been very fortunate, you know, having been here for as long as I have, and especially in those early years, like we were just traveling a lot. We we're probably traveling 11 months of the year and going to all these amazing places and, and doing our best to spend some time um, enjoying them ourselves. And so I've been really fortunate. I, I think as someone who started surfing kind of in their mid teens, um, I, I wouldn't have dreamed that I'd ever go to 99% of the places I've been able to go. So it, it's hard to say like, Oh, I, you know, I still, there's places I want to go, but, and you know, I, I just from a cultural perspective, but also a surfing perspective, I'd love to go to Japan. Um, I, I'm, I've never been, and uh, I, I think it'd be really interesting to check check out the culture there. And I know we have a lot of 
people from Japan that follow us and and send us messages that I really appreciate. I'd I'd love to go out there and check that out. And then just from a, a surfing perspective, I'd love to go to the northwest of Australia up at the Narlu Station and Kalbari mm-hmm. and places like that. Um, it just seems like it would push me a lot. Um, and it just seems like an incredible part of the world to, to check out. Um, and I wouldn't mind going back to Indonesia. <laughs> just warm water waves are always, I'm a positive on. Um, but yeah, those are the ones off the top of my head. What about you, Hendo? You got any that are on a bucket list that you want to check out? Uh, yeah, similarly, I, uh, I thought about this a lot last year about how lucky I've been and grateful and just privileged to be on this tour with WSL. I mean, I've went from hardly going anywhere to seeing the world within a year on the tour. And uh, I have seen some incredible places, surfed some crazy waves and met amazing people. I guess something that's not on that. I, that is on my list that I haven't surfed would probably be macaronis and the other would be raglan. So of course, being a goofy, got to get to those loves, but um, you know, I'm, I'm very satisfied with the waves I've surfed and the amount of places that WSL has taken me. I'm very grateful for that. So um it's been it's been a good run here. Um, all right. Well, we have one more question, and this was actually asked in the previous episode, and Lindsay answered it, but I thought that it would be great to hear your response as well. So the question is from at McGeester, and they write, what has been the most rewarding aspect of this podcast that you didn't expect? Hmm. I mean, I didn't expect it would work, so <laughs> that's probably, we're still doing it, I'm approaching 100 episodes. I mean, I guess that's not really fair. I, I did expect it would work, but I had very low expectations, so I was like, oh yeah, we're going to set the bar on the floor and we can kind of fall over it. Um, but I I mean, I, I guess the idea behind the podcast was always like, we, we're having these conversations anyways, you know, we're having them or we were before, before the pandemic, but, you know, in parking lots and coffee shops and on the beach and, and in bars. And I just think they're really interesting and, and why not record them and, and have people listen to them and have people weigh in. And, um, and then, yeah, I, I think, you know, having come from the, the media role I had at the ASP for a number of years, the communications role and getting, you know, kind of like real short sound bites, you know, post heat sound bites out of the world's best surfers for years and years and years that, um, I just knew that there was so much more to, to not only the CT surfers, but to everyone, um, you know, in the surfing space. And I thought, you know, well, podcast is a conversation and, and you can get so much more out of an hour, especially if there aren't any rules and, and you're not on broadcast or you're not freezing because you just got out of the water or you just want to get off a camera and you, you're sick of saying, I'm just building a house or whatever the hell you're saying after your heat. And it like, I think from, from that standpoint, I mean, the amount of um, guests that we've had on the podcast that have been really appreciative of the opportunity to, to talk and to speak their minds um, has been really, really rewarding. And at the same time, the amount of feedback we've gotten from our audience about the same thing has been really rewarding too. And, and as, as far as silver linings go, like it, you've know, gotten so many messages from listeners that I, I appreciate, um, just about how it's been helpful during the pandemic to have something, um, consistent, you know, to listen to and how it's part of people's routines and stuff. It's, that's, that's, I never expected that. And that's really rewarding. And I think that, um, surfing is, uh, a global community, this is just one way for, for me, um, to kind of dip my toe into that community and to, to learn, you know, cause we get all these messages and people like sharing information or asking questions or stimulating kind of ideas that, um, without it, you wouldn't have, you know, and I, I, I always felt like the thing that drew me to surfing in addition to it being really, really fun was it was a window to a, a bigger world, um, outside of my, you know, Orange County suburban upbringing. Um, and it was a world, it was a you know, window to different people and different ways of living and, and, you know, musics and different ways of thinking. And, and I always, I'm forever indebted to surfing for being that to me, in addition to being super fun. Right. And I, I think the most rewarding part of this podcast is it feels like that is doing its best to unintentionally honor that in a way, right. Where it's like, oh, cool. This is just horizon expanding not only for me or our guests but our listeners as well and it's sort of a shared 
um, experience, which, which I think is really cool. Um, so that'd be my answer for, for mag, mag, magister mag, mag gister or, or how are you going to pronounce it? Awesome. Well, uh, we all feel rewarded, uh, with your time and the conversations that you have with your guests. So thank you. And thank you so much to everybody who follows us on Instagram at the lineup pod for sending in your questions, for your support, your good vibes. Um, it's been great. I'm really stoked to be here and Dave, thank you for having me. Any final thoughts on the year or the year to come? Uh, anything else? No, well, I'm fortunate to have you with us too, Hendo, and, and appreciative of everyone um, who supports us at WSL, our CEO, Eric Logan, the leadership team, um, you know, the break room um, members and, you know, Jason Penning on the creative team, Dan Willen, um, everyone that kind of helps get this out, our editorial board. Um, it takes a lot of people and, um, and everyone kind of does it because they believe in it. It's not anyone's real job. So it's, uh, just something that we think is cool to do. And, um, yeah, I, I feel fortunate that we keep getting to do it. I, I hope everyone's been, um, as safe and healthy as possible as, as they could be this year. And I hope everyone's taking care of themselves with the holidays. And I hope everyone, um, you know, just takes time to check out, you know, it's, it's, whether it's the holidays or at any point in the year, I think it's okay to say, look, that's, that's enough. Um, I, I'm going to take some time to unplug and get back to being a human being. And it's actually going to make me a better, whatever, um, uh, husband, father, employee, son, daughter, cousin, uncle, whatever, you know, I, I think, uh, I think everyone's moving so fast these days and everyone feels this anxiety to have to be plugged in all the time and deliver and, if uh, the last year's taught me anything, it's that that's just completely not true. And uh, don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Mm. Agreed. Thank you, Dave. Cool. Thank you, Hendo. And thanks to everyone for listening. And we'll be back uh, with new episodes in the new year. Enjoy the holidays. <laughs>